And now in 2002, Simon Black is the Bradlow medalist. If you're going to be an inside midfielder or play at a high level, you've got to be clean with the ball below your knees, don't you? You've got to take it one first time. And Black wants to go very creative. Talk about not being quick, but my reaction time for the first sort of 10 metres was, was quite sharp, and I've spent a fair bit of time on that. There's Black again, and he goes for a second effort. Not being comfortable, just being at a, at, a, at a good standard, make it make it great, make it elite, and, and spend the time working on that. Clever handball by Black into the ground, end over end, so it would spin nicely for his mate there in Johnson. Everyone that plays the game gets known for something, what are their, what are their attributes, and um, you know you, you might not be quick, but you might have good endurance. You need to stand out from the crowd from something, and that's what, what you need to offer a footy club. Black is having a wonderful second quarter, looking for Lynch, and that is a terrific kick. Trading kick is a beauty to half to Black on his favourite side. Left foot kick is right through the middle. I'm not sure there would have been too many kids that would have spent more time playing little games as a kid, whether it was footy games down the park with five or six mates or you know small side basketball games and things and all those hours that you spend down the park in the backyard um, with your mates and brothers and what have you is just invaluable. Simon Black, how did he get out of there? Oh, he's pretty to watch, isn't he? One of the best you'll ever see. Black threads his way through again. Number 31. And Simon Black, who's having more and more influence on the game as it continues. His career high disposals, 37. He's just equaled that. What a day to do it. The Norm Smith Fiddlers for 2003, Simon Black. And that was this week's guest, Brownlow medalist, Norm Smith medalist and triple premiership player, Simon Black. Uh, welcome to the One on One Football Podcast. My name is Andrew Rains, founder of One on One Football, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Harry Simington. Welcome, Harry. Thanks, Rainsy. Good to be back. Another uh, our third Brownlow medalist. I think not many uh, podcasts in the twenties of episodes can say that they've had three on. That's um, pretty good, isn't it? Former teammate of yours as well. Yeah, former teammate and good mate. Um, Blackie's a sensational, sensational guy. Um, obviously, always got the time. Very humble. You wouldn't know chatting to him that what he's done in the game um yeah. all the accolades has gone gone with it but at the same time he's, he's just an incredible person and um he obviously had a, a fantastic career and just um some some incredible insights into um to his career and just more more so that sort of midfield craft and the knowledge he's got around that he's got a real passion for coaching and and helping younger players and as i said he's, he's so personable so some incredible insights yeah it's awesome and um we've had a few brisbane lions players on Rains, a few ex teammates of yours, a couple from the, the premiership era. Have you have you noticed any trends amongst them um from a personality perspective or um even not not just on the podcast, but what do you think makes that that group so successful? Oh, I think uh, we briefly discussed in this episode just their personalities uh traits and this is not the it's not a blueprint for everyone, but Brisbane through that time had a lot of um a lot of uh enforcer personality. So what I mean by that is is ruthless um, on field, very strong will personalities um types that drive them to so much success. Um, a lot of energy in those personalities too. A lot of, um, you know, sort of alpha male type of, type of set. And that doesn't mean, again, what I said before, that doesn't um, guarantee success. They've just got the real mix right within, within their team. Um, and, and so Blackie, Blackie obviously... Is uh, is is one of those uh, enforcer types, but I think he's got a bit more of a, a sort of a bubbly personality, and very personal. We go through a bit more of that in detail, but um, that's that's that type of they were well known for that too. Brisbane, you didn't have to really delve too much into their personality traits yeah. in terms of a, a scientific study or like that. You could yeah. sort of see the way they the way they went about it on the field. Yeah, it was an inter- and it was interesting. He said that um, he was a, a mozzie enforcer on on the field, but then off field a bit more of a of, of a thinker as well. And I think mm. um, you can really sort of um, you can really see that in in the episode um, with with the way that he, the detail I guess that he goes into on his on his midfield craft. Um, just on that um, on what you mentioned before about the the Brisbane Lions, I think they had a really complementary team. Like um, we spoke about this again in the episode coming up, where it was he was talking about um, Blackie's clean hands was complemented by Acker's speed on the outside. Um, but they also had that in terms of personalities as well. So I think a, a really um, a really robust team, but they, they all complemented each other as well. Yeah, they they just got the the balance right in in a lot of facets on and off the field, as you, as you sort of um, could could understand off Blackie and 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 he also discusses around that brotherhood and it's a, a bit of a cliche mm-hmm. word that gets thrown around a fair bit with teens, but they legitimately had a brotherhood in terms of the way they went about it. Um, didn't always probably agree with each other. He delves into a bit more about that too. Um, you know, some really those strong personalities can clash yeah. at times, and, and we, we had a bit of a laugh how they used to stir each other up and 
probably get in each other's faces a bit and get sick of each other. But that was um, that's what brothers do, don't they? I suppose yeah. I remember that with my brothers. You sort of not always uh, you're not always agreeing with stuff at times, but you always got that that sort of unconditional love for each other, the way they played, and you could definitely um, you know, you could definitely see that see that. And just the way it goes into the de- into detail with the midfield craft stuff, I think there's so much uh, value in there for our listeners as not only coaches but uh, players to um, to to. Listen to one of the all-time greats, um, and I don't say that lightly. He's, he's pretty much done everything within the game, and as I said, you you, you wouldn't know. Um, and without further ado, uh, this is episode number twenty-five. Sit back, enjoy, and uh, listen to Simon Black. You're listening to the One on One Football Podcast, the number one podcast for Aussie rules training, coaching, and development tips. Simon Black, thanks for joining us, mate, and welcome to the show. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, good, great to be with you, boys. Rainsy, good to see you, mate. It's been too long. <laughs> I know, Bucky. We will have to physically catch up. I know it's been a, a busy period for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, good to obviously have you on the show, mate. Um, mate, we'll just uh, we'll just kick off with a bit of your, you know, what sort of life entails for Simon Black these days, and um, you know, sort of a bit of your background too, mate. Just for our listeners, obviously, a lot of people know about you, but. Yeah, give us a bit of a rundown, mate. Yeah, I, I was, well, if I go way back, I guess, yeah, I was born in Queensland, um, but yeah, raised uh, in, in WA in Perth and um, played my, my football over there, played a lot of different sports as a kid, like a lot of us, I guess, and uh, yeah, had a had a, a father that was a Kiwi and uh, mum was West Australian, and so I played rugby before I played Aussie Rules, actually, but uh, yeah, and then yeah, grew into the passion for, for the game and um, and yeah, was was lucky enough to play for WA as, a, I guess, an 18-year-old. Um, didn't play sport for about 12 or 18 months when I was 16. I've got a, a complaint in my back called Schimmer's disease and that's been, a, I guess, an ongoing thing since my adolescence uh, with my spine and it sort of had to learn how to manage it and, and what have you. But, um, yeah, so I was lucky to get drafted to Brisbane in 97 drafts, a long time ago now. But um, And then, yeah, had 16 years at the, at the Lions. And, um, yeah, these days I uh, have a, like a football and education um, program which is based towards school leaver age bracket um, essentially we partner with the university where the students do either a diploma or a bachelor degree and uh, we run a football and athletic program around that and do a whole bunch of sort of life skill workshops as well and um, that's sort of my main form of work and uh, have three young children as well which keep me very busy mate. <laughs> yeah I can imagine and um, so mate obviously the, the Simon Black Academy you, you mentioned there what made you want to get into um, coaching and developing young people was it something that you, you always saw as a as a career post football, or did it sort of emerge after after your playing days? Oh, look, no, I guess I had a, always had a passion for that seventeen to 18, 19 age bracket where um, you know I think for all of us, it really those days don't feel like they're that long ago, um, even though they were you know twenty years ago plus for me. But um, you know, and when you come out of school, um, you know it's a big wide world out there, and you have aspirations to um, pursue your sport and. Um, I know when I even came to the Lions, you know, I was lucky to have some great mentors and some, um, I came from a great family, but I had some great mentors at the club um, as a young player and, and that really helped set me on my uh, on my way and gave me a great foundation to to go and be as, the best I could be, I guess. And um, and so that, that was never lost on me. So um, yeah, and whenever young players came into the system, I always really enjoyed working with them and helping develop their game and, um, and away from the footy field as well, I guess, too. So that really aligns with our academy program and um, we get a vast array of different capability levels and, um, you know, we, uh, yeah, really enjoy working with them, both female and male young players and um, help try and take the game to, to a new level is, um, is, is a lot of fun and, and really just as much trying to help develop them off the field has uh, is been a really enjoyable, enjoyable aspect to the academy. Um, we've been going for about, uh, about seven years this year and, um, we've had a, a few different programs around the country, so um, it's been yeah a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it, and um, hopefully it can can continue. Yeah, no doubt making a huge difference to people's lives, mate. It's, you get a huge thrill out of that, I reckon. When you, when I know we've discussed it before, um, you know when you when you give back, and, and no doubt you're doing a fantastic job, mate. We'll just go back to um, growing up. Um, obviously, you said a bit of a a, a, a mix of a New Zealand and WA there, but end up, end up being born in Mount Isa and then taking over to um, and then heading off over to WA and growing up. Um, give us a bit of a background of your of your youth and your younger days and how you actually got into football. With obviously, um, you know, as you said, I think through uh, your late father, great Ray, um, with through rugby union and then and then obviously uh, a bit of a talented eight hundred meter and fifteen hundred meter runner, mate. How'd you get into um to footy? 
Yeah, look, I guess like a lot of us, Ramsey, didn't we? We played a lot of different sports and, um, you know, I actually played rugby union before I played Aussie Rules with Dad's um, Kiwi background and really enjoyed it. Um, but, uh, yeah, played played a lot of different sports and uh, the kids at school all playing Aussie Rules in, in Perth and, and so I got into it that way and, and just really grew a passion for, for, for the game and um, the West Coast Eagles were my team that I loved and, yeah, it all it was, um, it was just a, I was very fortunate with my upbringing. I came from a very... Great family, very supportive family, and um, and, and did live, yeah, as you said, a fair bit of little athletics as, as a kid. And for me, little athletics was such a great uh, a great foundation for my footy. Um, you know, if I think if you ask most footballers when they get most nervous, it's probably for a start of a right on the start line of a three k time trial or a, you know two k trial, whatever it is. So um, there's no one there to help you, is there? When you when you've got to pound out a few a couple of kilometres. So um, yeah, that that was fantastic for me and. Um, yeah, and the other, the other sports I think that were that were great for footy was, you know, basketball. Um, played a lot of basketball as a kid, and and played soccer as well as a kid. And those transferable skills with, you know, I guess spatial awareness and um, the attributes that um, you know align with with our game were fantastic. So um, yeah, I was lucky to have a great uh, upbringing with a lot of different sports involved. It was yeah, it's fantastic. And mate, you so obviously you played for East Fremantle before getting picked up uh, by the Brisbane Lions. You're a West Coast fan as well. Um, Rainsy just filled me in before. Is there a story around why West Coast didn't take you? Something to do with a to do with a speed test? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was in, in the East Fremantle zone, and um, I'm sure I mentioned earlier, but I, yeah, I didn't play sport for about twelve months because of my back. I had Schumann's disease um, in my spine, and that was uh, that was a really tough period. About sort of yeah, about the sixteen um, age bracket where, um, during adolescence, I just got a lot of pain in my back and, um, I've, to this day, I mean, I have it for the rest of my life. It's something I've had to manage and, and learn to manage throughout my playing days and, and life in general. So, um, when I, when I, I guess came healthy again on the, on the back of that, I, I had about, um, maybe just over 12 months to, to get back into footy and really try to, my goal was to represent the WA 18 state team at the national carnival. And, um, and that was a real, a real drive. So, um, I, Got a sprint coach, um, and I started going to the gym a little bit. They were my two two real goals, I guess, to, to start to build my body up a little bit. I was always so skinny, um, and and get a little bit of a yard of pace. I was never never blessed with much pace, um, as you know, Rainsy. So, um, but the sprint coach really helped me. He was the Eagle sprint coach, and um, when I represented WA, and <laughs> now, nah, well, yeah, he helped a lot. I must say, and anyway. Um, I was lucky to have play for the WA side at the National Carnival and have a reasonable carnival and look the Eagles show a little bit of interest but they said look we want you to do the the 20 meter or the 40 meter sprint test through the gates and um, my sprint coach was actually the West Coast Eagles sprint coach at the time Mark Neitz and uh, and he said um, yeah they want to test you so it's pretty nervous the night before so I knew the time I had to get um, anyway did the test the next morning and I was a fair way off the off the mark that they wanted uh, and they basically said, look, you know, unless you're there late in the draft, uh, we're, we're not going to take you, um, certainly in the first, you know, large part of the draft. So, yeah, I, um, yeah, I was sort of hoping I was going to get through late in the draft and maybe West Coast still, but uh, anyway, it didn't turn out that way. So ended up uh, in Brisbane. Yeah, for sure. And then, mate, obviously moving from the west coast of Australia to the east coast of Australia at such a young age is a, is a massive move. It's, it's a big move regardless. But obviously being that far away from friends and family, how, how did you manage that um, that transition to a new state, new club um, at such a young age? Yeah, Harry, I often say that my first year at the Lions was my, probably my biggest growth year uh, of my life. Uh, moving away from home, pretty well looked after at home, I must say. And so coming across and... Um, you know, learn to cook and clean for yourself and learn to get lost in the new city and uh, learning to form, you know, new relationships with, um, you know, people a lot older than you and, and all those sort of things. It was a real year of being out of your comfort zone for, for large parts of it, but uh, but such a growth year and such a year of, um, you know, of great development. So um, I was lucky to get an opportunity uh, in the, my first year to play nine games of AFL footy and I was really, it was probably before I was, I was ready. Um, I only played two le- league games off the bench for East Romano the year before, and I was such a skinny, skinny kid. So I think we had a lot of injuries um, at the Lions, the older guys that first year. So um, yeah, I got lucky, I guess. But uh, yeah, it was it was a great great introduction to footy. I mean, we won the wooden spoon, but I, I was I had a great year because I was in an AFL club. I think this is fantastic. Um, and, and then and then uh, Lee Matthews arrived the next year, but. Uh, 
yeah, it was it was a it was a great year to look back in '98 and um and get a taste for footy and, and learn to sort of grow up and become become a man, bit more of a man, no, I guess. Um, yeah, incredible, mate. It is a huge. I remember moving to obviously Melbourne my first year and probably is. It's a great point. That's probably your biggest year, I think, when you you leave home and you got to do things on your own and and um and actually sort of grow up and, and become an adult, which is which is certainly did, mate. Obviously, there's um when I got to Brisbane and hearing the stories that you usually do, obviously, obviously in the in the glory years that you guys got and um, it had obviously in the early 2000s but with you and sort of that when you first got to the club you heard a few rumors you just were in Michael Voss's hip pocket um, and developing your craft and and with all that as you said with some incredible mentors um, talk us through how you sort of built your game and, and really we're, we're big on establishing your craft and your weapons and things like that here on, on the podcast and, and obviously in our platform but Talk us through some of those early days, and and yeah, was was it Vossi? Was it the, obviously the, the the incredible teammates you had that helped you along there? Um, and and yeah, talk us through some of the extras and, and things individually you sort of got up to with your craft. Yeah, Range, you get a two year contract when you you know when you get drafted, and um, and I was always a bit of a self doubt. I didn't think I'd I'd last long in, in the AFL, and um, but one thing I didn't want to be was have regrets when I was fifty that I didn't didn't try hard enough. Um, and so when I came to the club, I I seeked out. Um, a couple of guys, yeah, Michael Voss and, and Craig Lambert was the other one, and I saw an opportunity um, to, I wanted to be an inside midfielder, um, but my body type wasn't real conducive at probably 75, 76 kilos to be an inside midfielder, and um, so I knew it was going to be a journey to, to get to that point, but um, what I did was I, I, I grabbed Vossi over two pre-seasons really, and, um, and, and after, after the pre-season, training sessions I would grab Vossi and we'd do some contested ball work and it was just the old coach roll the footy out um, and you'd fight for the ball and um, look you know he was obviously much bigger much stronger much better um, and and for me it was look I, I was very much out of my comfort zone um, and what allowed me allowed me to use my 76 77 kilos to the best of his ability and you know he'd push me out of the way and, and get to the ball first but as long as I kept my feet that was a real learning around keeping my feet, then I was in the contest and I could tackle him and, 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 and halve the contest, if you like. So so for me, that was something that um, I persisted with him. And, you know, I know vulnerability is a, a pretty big buzzword these days, but as a young player, for me, I've got no doubt that was the, that was the one part, the one thing that I did that I stayed strong with that um, for two years, um, for, for two summers, um, and all my teammates would... You know, they had a bit of a laugh and a joke about it. That you know, good on your black. He go over and get flogged by Vossi again, um, and I would. I'm not sure I ever beat him in a contested ball, but I, I learned to use my my frame, my body to body the best of its ability, and and that enabled me to, I guess, to have the confidence and belief and the the capability to sort of help in the hustle bust bustle of being an AFL inside midfielder um, over time. And there's probably no one better to to to, to be up against than Vossi. And um, yeah, I'm pretty glad that I. I made that decision um, as a young player at the footy club. And what sort of – like, obviously, it's a personality thing and, and trait that it's probably been with you since day one, but did it did it spur you on that you were obviously getting, you know, sort of beaten by him or, or as I said, the boys are sort of joking around? What what sort of – what was going through your mental side of that, at that point where you, you feel like you're getting better and, and stronger each time um, and then you're sort of getting more confidence and results come game day? What, what sort of kept – because – what can happen, especially a lot of young kids, is they, they do it for a week or two and then they drop off. What what sort of kept you going and motivated throughout that period? Yeah, you, you need a hook. I think, you know, you need something that just gives you nourishment throughout um, whatever you're doing. And, and for me, it was around just trying to find little wins and little gains. And, um, you know, early days, I'd get pushed over and fall over. And, and um, you know, I'd be embarrassed and things. But, yeah, I learned sort of, you know, when he'd come towards me with his body, how I'd step around him and or how I'd... Um, you know, brace for the contact or, you know, whatever it was to, to, to ultimately keep my feet and stay in the contest. And, and those little things were invaluable for, for a young player. Um, you know, I was probably 12 or 15 kilos lighter than him and um, those little aspects around body position and, and so forth were really significant um, to, to me then being given an opportunity by Lee Matthews in the midfield and, and then, you know, grasping that and, and sort of, I guess, trying to run with it. Yeah, totally. And Matt, I want to ask you a little bit about um, that core midfield group. It's um, known as the Fab Four, which is yourself, Michael Voss, Jason, Jason Ackermanis, and Nigel Lappin. Um, do you think that it was little training habits like like arriving to training early and um, doing extras after training? Do you think that's what made your, your core midfield group so successful? Yeah, but part of it, we certainly had a 
good work ethic, Harry. Um, it was almost like there was a real brotherhood in terms of we sort of knew where we were and um, we had a really good mix of inside and outside. Um, you know, Acker was probably your real speedster outside and, you know, I knew if I had my head over the ball that he'd be floating around somewhere to give a handball and um, I needed him because of my lack of pace and he probably needed me to get the ball to him. And, you know, not, Nigel was probably a bit of both inside and outside and, and Vossi as well. So it was, it, was, it was a really nice mix and, you know, there's other guys, Luke Power was in there as well and, and things, but it was a real synergy that, that we had and, um, yeah, it was like we'd sort of grown up in the backyard together. No, it's unreal. We actually had um, we actually had Big Sauce on um, a couple of weeks ago, and he, he used to mention about tr- the young boys tr- when obviously you're in your prime by then. But when Rog and those sort of boys were a bit younger and they're coming through and they tried to you know ramp up their professionalism and trying to to beat you guys onto the track or post track or get to the club early, and they just couldn't outdo. So obviously it was a fair bit. Obviously with the natural talent that you guys showed, but. Obviously, the work ethic, and as you said, but that brotherhood spurring each other on. And I think when you set that bar with your teammates, you, you, try, you actually try and do out, outdo each other, but in the right way, and it pushes everyone along. So incredible insight there. And hopefully, a lot of footballers can pick, it, pick um, a fair bit out of that, mate. Um, with, your, with your stoppage work now, we'll focus on a bit of craft stuff. And just um, as you mentioned before, I know you... You joke around a bit with your with your lack of leg speed, but as I said, I, I played a fair bit with you and, and against you, and and you, you wouldn't notice that out on the on the track or out on the on the ground come game day. Was there any particular areas that sort of stoppages that should have helped your anticipation? You obviously had incredible anticipation around stoppages and your timing that made up maybe for a bit of lack of that leg speed that you that you sort of mentioned. Um, was there any focus? I know there's one point I remember sort of working with you and, and, and a lot of footballers turn their back, say, from a boundary throw and they turn their back from the ball and you were big on watching the ball the whole way down and then keeping your eye on the ball and, and getting that timing right. Yeah, look, look with, with stoppages, I, I think, um, you know, really good stoppage players and stoppage craft is, um, you know, your timing of your movements, timing of your, your physicality with an opponent. Um, you know, the better better player you become, the, the, the more attention you're going to get from an opposition, opposition and th- then it becomes really important to get your timing of your physicality right um, and the timing of your of your movement right so those two your timing of your physicality and timing of your movement is all important um, you get there too early obviously you, you overrun the ball and or it hit you in the hit you in the face and uh, um, or it goes behind you and if you get there too late you get beaten to the ball so um, yeah that that time and my, my reference uh, was was generally around when the ball reaches its highest point out of the umpire's hand so whether it's a boundary throwing um, you know, watching the ball side on, getting some reference in the air where the ball is. Um, you know, if your back's to the boundary, it's hard to really know where the ball is. You sort of you only start to see it once it comes it comes in front of you. So, yeah, that side on stance was was really pertinent for me to get my movement and give myself some space. You know, if it's from when the ball leaves the umpire's hands for a boundary throwing and to when it hits the ruck's hands, it's, it's it's almost three seconds, and you can run a fair way in that time. So, giving yourself not getting sucked in too close too early to the to the rucks is is really important. I mean, those boundary throwings, you'll often see. You know, it might be a, a short boundary throwing from the umpire. So, you know, you've got the, got the the ruckman coming from the corridor towards the boundary. You get too close too early. You know, you can almost run into them. So that reference around where the ball is in the air um, to, to gauge when to move is, is really important. And, and that relates to, you know, centre bounces and ball ups as well. I, you know, I, I feel that, you know, from both ball ups and centre bounces, once the ball reaches its highest point, if you're the go-to player, um, you know, you, you don't want to end up where you start. You want to you move into some space and you want to move into space so that when you get the ball, you, you, you're getting at a bit of pace and momentum so you can get out of, of congestion and um, or even if you get you get some some defensive pressure tackler you can at least sort of hopefully get your arms through just and handball the ball purely just through your um momentum you know that's that's really really important um yeah i can talk for a while about stoppages mate it's um yeah i mean there's there's a lot to it and um but just yeah when you're the go-to play your, your timing around your movement's really important your physicality not giving your back up i know you you know the, the, the i get blown away these days that a lot of sides still don't use a tight checking player on the best midfielders in the competition and um you know i know Lockie neil last night copped a bit um um f- from melbourne last night and the very best in the com I, I get surprised that they don't do that regularly enough but um yeah but not being able to give you back up um so you get squeezed under i think if you are in a center bounce as an example and you're playing that sweeper position what you're trying to do is, if you've got a player next to you, get on their back and squeeze them under and own that defensive part of the circle so you can 
you can be there for a defensive part of it or you can be in a handball release option out the back. And um, yeah, all those little little trick things are really important. But, but for any young player listening, I think the great thing that you can do at a really low key, lowly level, low key level is even with your dad or a friend in the park of just the ability of, you know, if they become the umpire, then, then they become the, uh, the, the ruckman. They throw the ball up over their head and they tap the ball to a certain position and just your timing to get to that position at the right time and getting the gauge of how far you can move in that um, amount of time the ball's in the air. Um, and you can really get a really good feel and understanding um, just by doing that repetition over and over. And um, you watch Lockie Neal as a good example or... You know, the good uh, stoppage players in the competition, the ability to move and get through the contest and their timing around that um, is, is all important. Uh, it's a good good point, mate. Um, I think um, the other one too is, as you said, the, the com- complexity of it all, stoppages and things like that. It's, you just got to try and simplify, but every player is, is different. And then, as you mentioned before, throw a tagger into it and probably 300 out of your 322 games, you you probably have one of those. One of me, mate, on your, on your back most games. Um <laughs> <laughs> any any tips and and sort of uh, insights? Obviously, as you said, you watched um, you watched uh, Lockie Neal last night. Any like how'd you work yourself work your way through that? So it's not only just the, the learning the craft, and then you get thrown on top of that. Is it a negator or a tagger or, or, or sort of a lockdown midfielder on your on your back or on your tail? How did you work yourself through that? Were there different sort of any more tips or insights on on the way you sort of combated that? Because I remember, yeah, playing with you. you. You probably used to get it most weeks, and it was just, yeah, it was like just common, common sort of thing. After a while, you just got used to it. Yeah, look, I mean, early days, it, it can be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, overwhelming, confronting when you've got a really physical player on you. But you've just got to. That's where the. That's where your, um, you know, your real competitiveness needs to come out, and you've got to work through it. It, it, it does become personal. Um, there's nothing about that, and, and and I really learned to enjoy that that battle I'd have with players and. Oh, look, look, what I would say is that you know that the, the tag is, as you know, Ramsey, more often than not, they want to play you from behind because they can control you, can control your hips, they can push you forward. Um, you get the ball, they can tackle you easy. If you play inside onto someone um, to your tagger, we, you can you can push them out of the way, you can get some separation. And for me, I learned through over time the importance of of at a stoppage, uh, for instance. Of just moving around, don't be stationary. If you if you if you if you're stationary, they're going to sweat all over your back, and they can they can own you, can push you in. So literally just walking around in, in that confined area, and again having an awareness of the umpire, of where the ball is. He's picking it up for a boundary throw or for a boundary throwing, or the ball up. He's now throwing it up. Um, okay, I've organised in my ruck and where I want to where the tap's going to go to and your timing around, around when to give them a really good shove. So I'd try and hit them with a, the, the heel of my palm and through their chest and the biggest surface areas of their chest. So I'd go looking for that. And, and that, would, that would be a, a case of you know, turning my shoulders. And it'd be, you know, you, you, I use the term toe to target. Um, and toe to target means you're in a position of strength because your hips are facing towards the opponent. And if you get yourself in that position, then you give, you're in a maximum position of strength. And... Yeah, so that that was a really big one for me um, to get that separation at the right time and then move move those three or four meters into where I wanted to be. And yeah, that that's a big part of stoppage craft for mine, particularly if you're getting a, a heavy tag. Um, and then if you don't get it first off Ruck's hands, just keep moving in that confined area um, because if you if you've got half a meter off an opponent, you know you've got that's a bit of space. You know you can get the ball and your hands are clean, are clear. So that constant moving uh, in that confined area, whether you're there to get a handball receive or tackle an opponent, um, is really important for, for young players. It's not just, oh, I didn't get it off our ruck's hand, so I'll stand stationary. No, you've got to keep moving and, and, and get involved with that next bit of play. Yeah, awesome. And, mate, I want to ask you a question about um, Dr. Phil Jauncey, who's obviously, um, his personality profiling system was a big part of the, um, the success in the, in the early 2000s. Could you explain a little bit more about what that profiling system entailed and how it actually helped you guys, um, I guess, on field and off field? Yeah, it was around just getting to know each other, not knowing ourselves um, individually who we were and, 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 and what works for you, you um, whether it's a lead up to a game or, um, you know, or just who you were, I guess, post personality profiling wise. It was a great insight. It was a really good learning. Um, I remember Phil said to me, I was a, a mozzie enforcer and, I was really different from on field to off field. Um, I was probably more a mozzie enforcer on field and off field probably more more thinker um, actually. But he used to say to me, 
like if you try to impress people, you suck. <laughs> so don't don't try to impress people, and that sort of always stayed with me. Um, just sort of yeah, be yourself and <laughs> don't don't try too hard. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, but look, it was amazing. Like, we'd be in the room like for the game, and we'd we'd have the opposition uh, personality profiling because he went to the draft camps and he interview these young kids coming through so we had all the opposition and he'd have uh, different ways of, of suggestions of how we would uh, should should approach them whether we would individually uh, abuse them or get into them or whether you take your direct opponent would or or, or, or or all this different stuff you know some players like confrontation so you wouldn't be aggressive towards them verbally and, and different things and but I guess more importantly than that it was just going to know each other as teammates and you know we, we had you know we had Acker as a teammate and Jason Nakimanis was uh, was a was a wonderful player, but he, he you know he obviously uh, said and did some things that uh, that at times probably frustrated the playing group. And um, but we we understood Acker understood his his personality and, and things. And when you understand someone, you have more more patience and more tolerance and more understanding yeah for them. So um, that that was a great management tool for for not just him but for for everyone within the group. And um, you know some guys like to be left alone pre game. Some guys like to um, you know, like to chat and be busy and what have you. So, yeah, it was it was a right, really valuable tool for our footy club. Yeah, that's awesome. And obviously the different personalities can complement each other, similar to how you're talking about um, Akka's speed would complement your inside work. I think it's it's obviously similar in terms of personality. Just for those that are um, unfamiliar with the with the profiling system, could you explain a little bit about what each one was? So you've got the Mozzie Enforcer, Thinker and Feeler, I believe. Yeah, yep, Mozzie Enforcer, Think a feeler, and, and you're generally a combination of two of those. Um, so uh, the mozzie was, you know, your typical busy, very talkative, um, buzzing around, uh, very interactive with others, I guess, and uh, enforces that really assertive, uh, as it sounds, assertive, um, you know, I guess dominant um, attribute. Um, I think is as it sounds, you know, very much sort of think of analytical mind and, and feel it again, as it sounds. So you're generally a combination of, of two of those. Yeah. We had a lot of, we had a lot of sort of mozzie enforcers and, and it's amazing how the thinker, thinker feel. I mean, we didn't have too many thinker feelers, um, but we had a few thinker enforcers and, you know, how the mozzie enforcer and the thinker enforcer sort of interact was always pretty interesting too. It just was a great tool for us to understand ourselves personally and then our teammates as well and, and how that really, um, helped understand each other and and become more patient and tolerant at times and, and things and even to the point where we we had profiles for opposition players because of the draft camp um where phil um got the chance to uh to profile them so yeah it was a really valuable um little piece that we had uh, in the early 2000s at the footy club and 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 um, you know, teams that played against you at the time, we would know this too. It's, um, I reckon you had a lot of enforcers, like that enforcers and mozzie. I think Acker mm. was on a couple of weeks ago, two, a month or two ago now, and he mentioned that too. Like a lot of that enforcers, um, you know, Lepa, Vossi, these sort of top players, um, and then a lot of mozzies too. Um, and it must have just sort of set that. I mean, no, there's no sort of template, and you can't go out and try and mimic it for other teams. It must have been just the perfect mix that you sort of had. Um, and I remember, I think we tried to redo it again when I was there playing and Vossi was coaching and, and we did it again. I, I just, for the people out there that find it interesting, I think Brown, look, so you can have a mix, you're right, Bucky, you can have a mix of a few, and, and but Brownie was like 99% enforcer and then he might have like one mozzie or whatever it was. He was so high up, it was just ridiculous and sort of goes with the big fella's uh, personality, I think. <laughs> yeah, and it was great when, you know, the mozzie, we had a lot of mozzie enforcers and a lot of thinker enforcers and, and how the mozzies... And the and the for, and the thinkers uh, when they're both enforcers really mixed with each other was was really interesting and there was sort of a bit of, bit of confrontation at times from um, you know Lepper's personality was a bit different to my personality for instance and we might be both enforcers but uh, yeah it was it was a great it was a great tool Phil was a bit of a really sort of ahead of his time in that and the way he used it um, with us it was yeah it was great I forgot you you did it when you came to the club too did did Phil come back into the club then or did no I don't know they might have I don't think it was actually Phil might have been his, his template or what he might have maybe he did I'm not so sure but we did it and I, yeah I was I was similar to you mate just pretty hard miles and. And in, in Forcer type, had a bit of Enforcer, but yeah, mainly sort of Moz, uh, pretty high up on the Moz chain, I think, so, so that's probably why we connected pretty well and buzzed around each other. So, 
around the around the locker rooms, mate, and on the field. So um, yeah, no, it was it was really good, and I think it's um and and I reckon coaches and and uh, and players, or especially probably coaches, listen to this. I would highly recommend. It doesn't have to be that uh, model. It could be something sort of similar that just to sort of get to know your teammates. I think it's a highly highly um, uh, valuable to to your team for sure, mate. We brought up um Vossi's name a fair bit. Uh, on the show now, just obviously a, a, a hero of of yours, sort of coming through as you said, and, and obviously mine for for being a young Queenslander, sort of coming through and watching Vossi for all those years. Now, um, just a quick question about his his coaching mate at Carlton. How you sort of seen um, his his first year there? Seems to be going pretty well. Our good mate Lucky Power, obviously under him, and, and they seem to be playing some reasonable football. Carlton. Yeah, well, they often say, don't they, that you know a player's. Um a player's background or player's attributes, if you like, when they go from player to coach, can be stamped on their playing group. And I think you can see that with Carlton this year. They've really been strong in the contested ball and the clearance part of the game. And they really, that midfield group's really driving their legs when they get the footy and been, um, you know, doing a great job um, as a group and been a really powerful side. So, um, yeah, he's, he's oh, I'm really wrapped. He's got a second opportunity and, um, you know, he's got some great experience over the last seven years in, in South Australia at Port. And, um, Lukey tells me he's, he's, he's grown, had even a little bit more empathy, um, which I'm not sure he had too much back in the day, but he's, uh, he's, he's matured and found a little bit of that, which is, uh, no, in, in all seriousness, it's good to, good to see. And I guess that's a big part of, um, of modern coaching, isn't it? You've got to have a, that element of, um, of, of your makeup too. So, um, yeah, it's early days, but he's got a good group to work with. I tell you that, hasn't he? He's got, he's got a, a good squad there to, to work with. So I think it's going to be a really good, um, few years coming up and, and our old mate, Lucky Powers, um, yeah, I think he's just a great fillet for, for Vossi. Um, he's such a great connector of people and a great relationships guy and just a, one of the very best uh, people you meet in the footy. So Vossi's very lucky to have him. Yeah, definitely. And, and obviously good to good to see them have a bit of success and it'll be good to see how they um, how they go this year. But Lucky, mate, if you... So being a few years out of the game now and obviously knowing what you know, working with young people um, in, you know, obviously some sort of a mentoring role, um, if you could go back and give some piece of advice to your 18-year-old self, um, what would it be? It doesn't have to be football-related, just any type of advice. You've got to enjoy playing. I think that's the big one. You've got to enjoy, you know, if you want to aspire to play at the highest level, there's a fair bit of hard work that goes in into that, as we know. And so um, you've got to enjoy it. You, you start playing the game um, because you enjoyed it and you found it fun. And being able to continually find that um, within the game is, is really, was really important. Um, so that that's a big one. Um, look, you know, AFL recruiters are going to talk about the the elite level. Um, you know, I mean, everyone everyone that plays the game gets known for something. What are their what are their attributes? And um, you know, you you might not be quick, but you might have good endurance. Um, you, you know, you might be you might be a really good mark, um, or you're going to be known for something. And I know they talk about what's your weapon. Um, I think you guys might have mentioned it earlier, and and that's because you need to stand out from the crowd from something, um, and, and that's what what you need to offer a, a footy club. Um, so, not being comfortable, just being at a, at, a, at a good standard, make it make it great, make it elite, and, and spend the time working on that. Um, yeah, for me, it was you know my endurance and my ability to cover the ground. So I had to be really strong at that. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I joke about not being quick, but my reaction time for the first sort of ten meters was was quite sharp, and I spent a fair bit of time on that and. Just being clean. Um, if you're going to be an inside midfielder and or would play at a high level, you've got to be clean with the ball below your knees, don't you? You've got to take it one first time, and um, and then once you've got it in your hands, sort of how you how you see the game. And um, I, 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 you know, I, I'm not sure there would have been too many kids that would have spent more time playing little games as a kid, whether it was footy games down the park with five or six mates, or you know, small side basketball games and things, and all those hours that you spend down the park in the backyard um, with your mates and brothers and what have you is just invaluable to um, to you to, to really, that's how you develop skill and that's how you develop, develop your ability. And yeah, I, I spent a lot of time as a kid um, in, 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 in um, unstructured play, if you like, just with mates and, and family, what have you. So, um, but yeah, just trying to find a way to enjoy it because it can become pretty serious, um, you know, when it does get a bit more serious professional, professional level and, been able to keep that enjoyment and for me I, I had um you know surfing's always been a passion so getting away from 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 football um hanging with your mates or whatever it was that that's um that's really important too to, to have other other hobbies um away from away from the football field 
No, I couldn't say it a bit better, mate. It's uh, it's incredible. Um, yeah, to have that sort of small side of games and, and just play an unstructured. So I think a lot of the coaching's coming back to that, or, or or actually looking and turning to that, especially with a lot of junior football these days. And what I'm seeing and and the work um of of sort of done through the academies and and working with junior players, they just they get so much out of. It. I think there's a time for that sort of uh, closed skill stuff to work on your hands or your kicking or whatever it is, but. Uh, decision making and, and especially these days there's so much going on and the complexity of the game at times and and how it's played i think that's that's so important mate um just with um obviously you did some work with us early days on the platform mate. it was awesome to sort of have you and in, in, involved and 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 then with your commitments with your own business um taking over we mentioned it early that you the simon bike academy but we you give it a bit of a pump up mate what's um how do young people enroll in in the Simon Buck Academy for those that, that could be listening to look at do a tertiary education or a, another a learning uh, piece to their to their trade and, and, and getting the um the Blackie Academy yeah it's it's uh, our website simonblack.com.au and um yeah, it's a bit self indulgent isn't it Rainsy? um look yeah it's uh, it's, it's a, we're an education and footy program and um it's for school leaver age bracket we uh we we take males and females um from from sort of 17 onwards and um it's a diploma at the first year which runs into a bachelor of business second and third year and we the aim part of our days our, our football and athletic program and um and uh yeah we've, we've got a program here in in brisbane and um south australia and we uh we spend a fair bit of time around the, the personal development um side of things which is our third pillar um outside of football and education and spend a lot of time around goal setting and um around you know, understanding leadership and um, culture and organisations and uh, our nutrition and um, financial budgeting and all these sort of things. So we try to make a bit of a rounded approach and um, and try to find sort of employment outcomes on the back of it for our for our students. So uh, yeah, it's really enjoy it, mate. And um, yeah, we're we're um, we're having some fun along the way. So it's been a good few years. Yeah, that's awesome. And we'll have the uh, we'll have the link for the um, to the Simon Black Academy in our show notes, guys. So if you're listening and you're and you're interested, head down there, check it out. Um, Lucky mate, thanks so much for for joining us. That's about all we've got time for for the main episode. We're about to record the the bonus episode exclusive to Footy IQ members. But um, mate, thanks for thanks so much for joining us and and sharing your your story. I know I, I learned a lot, and um, and yeah, hopefully all the listeners did too. Thanks, Legend. Oh, pleasure. Good to have a chat with you, boys. <laughs> all the best, eh? And that brings us to the end of the main episode. Blackie uh, actually hung around for another 15 to 20 minutes to help us break down some midfield craft in detail. This week we dis- dissected some recent clips from Gun midfielder and what I believe uh, a red hot favourite for the Brownlow medal, Clayton Oliver. Um, this bonus segment is exclusive to Footy IQ members, so if, you've, um, if you're a member, head over to the Insights Library now and you can find the video in the folder named Positional Craft. And if you're not a member yet, you can either follow the link in the show notes for the Footy IQ membership or just Google Footy IQ, where the first website that pops up. You can start your seven-day free trial today, giving you instant access to not only this clip with Simon Black, but uh, plenty more hours um, and plenty more videos of content like it. Um, Give it a crack. If you love footy, you won't regret it. Thanks for listening to the one-on-one football podcast. If you got something out of today's episode, we'd love it if you could leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to stay updated on special guests, new episodes, and more, please subscribe to the show on your chosen platform. And finally, if you have any questions for Rainsy or myself, or you want to get a particular guest on the show, please reach out. Our email address is podcast at one-on-onefootball.com.au. Thanks, guys. We'll see you for the next episode.